It's okay to critique some some missteps of purity culture without throwing the biblical concept of purity away. But to act like the way that you present your body, male or female, the way that you present your body is a non-issue to the Lord, uh, th that that's not correct. It is an issue to the Lord. Hey everyone, welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast. This isn't my typical day to release a podcast episode, so this is kind of a special bonus episode that I'm doing with my friend John Cooper of Skillet. We were kind of texting back and forth about some news that happened last week in regard to a song that Matthew West recorded called Modest is Hottest and the swift and definite attempt to cancel him from progressive Christian Twitter. So we're gonna talk about all things purity culture, Modesty, Matthew West, Modest is Hottest, and try to analyze this from a biblical worldview. Hey everybody, what's up? It's John Cooper here. We have a special episode. This isn't Cooper stuff. It is a mashup uh, with me and my good friend, Elisa Childers. I have a good name for it. I think we should call it Childers Stuff. Oh, I like it. Yeah. Kind of yeah. like, a, you know, like when they take the two last names and mash them together. I think so. Yes. Childer stuff. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to sing as good, but then I was thinking I could recreate the logo with some hair on it. Yeah. With the beard, but with the hair. Anyway, and a this is going to be. Has to wear a turtleneck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny today. You're on fire. Here's what we're going to do. I'm so excited because there's a big drama this week with um, Matthew West, the Christian singer, and his song, Modest is Hottest. And there's a whole big thing happening with purity culture. I knew I needed some help with this. And so I thought, I'm gonna call my friend, Elisa. We're gonna do a mashup. I'm gonna say funny stuff. She's gonna say smart stuff. And everybody's <laughs> gonna watch this up in here. <laughs> well, this is great. I love this. Yeah, and just for anyone watching, this isn't like my podcast where I'm interviewing John or John's interviewing me. We're just going to talk as brothers and sisters in Christ about what's happened. And this is sort of, um, it's, I really wanted to talk about this, John, because number one, this song, Modest that Ho Modest is Hottest, is a song that has become like on repeat in our house. So my daughter loves this song. We all know all the words. We've watched the video. It's super funny. And also because like, I kind of want to stick up for Matthew West here because we have all, you know, both you've been in the music business longer than, than I was, but I come out of the music business and I, I, I get what he was doing. And I, you know, progressive Christian Twitter has essentially tried to cancel him for this song, Modest is Hottest. And so for our viewers and listeners, I'm just going to give a sort of a, a flyover of what has happened. If this is kind of news to you, um, Matthew West wrote a cute little kind of song. It's a joke. Like the song is is meant to be funny. It's sort of a a, a spoof. It's it's about an overprotective dad a little bit kind of talking to his daughter. So I'm going to go ahead and read the lyrics here and uh, just to give us an idea of this song. So the words go, dear daughter, it's me, your father. I think it's time we had a talk. The boys are coming round because you're beautiful and it's all your mother's fault. So he's He's giving his wife a little compliment there. She's beautiful, and the girl's got her beauty. And then he says, I've been trying hard to raise you up right. No drinking, no smoking, no swearing. But your old man's got a little more advice when it comes to the clothes that you're wearing. And then the chorus goes like this. Modest is hottest, the latest fashion trend. It's a little more Amish, a little less Kardashian. What the boys really love is a turtleneck and a sensible pair of slacks. Honey, hottest is modest, sincerely your dad. And then the second verse says, if I catch you doing dances on the TikTok in a crop top, so help me God, you'll be grounded till the world stops. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. Because modest is hottest, and then goes back into the chorus, and then the bridge is all the parents be saying their prayers, that their girls, they'll be wearing more layers. Moms and dads around the world, yeah, they're on their knees. Lord, make them more like Jesus and less like Cardi B. And then he says, no offense to Cardi B. I'm sure she's a really nice girl and Jesus loves her, but I just think modest is hottest, the latest fashion trend. So then he goes back into the chorus there. And so this was met with a swift and definite 
attempt to cancel from progressive Christian Twitter. And there were pieces published in, I believe, Relevant Magazine. Uh, it even made Newsweek. I don't know if you saw that, John, but it, it made Newsweek. And the Relevant um, uh, headline was Matthew West deletes Modest is Hottest video after backlash. The Newsweek headline says Matthew West's Modest is Hottest song about daughter's clothing sparks backlash. And so we had people like uh, Joe Lumen, who is sort of a popular voice in progressive Christianity. She said, Modest is Hottest is a grooming narrative to get women to accept that they are sex objects that exist for the approval, <laughs> pleasure, and entertainment of men. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, I, this is this is really like what all of progressive Christian Twitter was saying. She says, therefore, it's also a way to normalize predatory behavior in men and avoid accountability when they abuse women. And then Audrey Assad uh, said, modest is hottest still centers men and their preferences and how women should look. Still, uh, It still sets being found hot by men as the ultimate goal for women and positions all men as creeps who can't handle seeing a woman's bare skin without turning into out-of-control monsters. So that's uh, that's sort of the, the flyover. There's a lot more we can get into as we go along. But So, John, what are you thinking when you're, you're <laughs> hearing some of these responses? Well, I had not heard those, so this is my my genuine reaction <laughs> is is laughter. That's what's funny is I was going to read you a response that I'll say when because it was in the Newsweek article that you mentioned. <clears throat> Just to add to this, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, first of all, it's like uh, like I think that you had texted me when I asked you if you'd seen this. No one has a sense of humor anymore. I know. It's like this the casualty a... of the woke of the woke mob is a sense of humor. I mean, this song is <laughs> it's a it's a joke. It's meant to be funny. I mean, and in the video, his daughters actually appear in shorts. It's not like he's really like putting them in burkas and telling them that if they show their legs, you know, men are going to turn into these sex crazed monsters. And so, yeah, I mean, it's just sad because it's like it's it's funny. It's a joke. It's just uh, uh, so. And the Newsweek has <clears throat> the one that says. Oklahoma pastor Jeremy Coleman shared a parody of the song on TikTok on Wednesday, voicing his criticisms. In Coleman's version, he sings, quote, Well, if I catch you doing dances on the TikTok, wear what you want. Girl, just go off. Hold your head up so your crown doesn't fall off. You're a queen if you forgot. So just wear what you want. The latest fashion trends, I probably won't get it, but it's not for me to understand. If the boys act like pig, pigs, tell them gouge out their eyes because I've got some shovels and some alibis. So just wear what you want and I'll love you till I die. And that goes on and on with some of the things that you're saying there. I saw another one that says, let's see. Um, he, this is uh, something that he quoted for Newsweek. He added, I understand wanting to protect your children, but why should my girls have to change who they are, be uncomfortable with who they are, because men are unable to appreciate women without sexualizing them? Telling your daughters to dress a certain way to curb their beauty is telling them they are being sexual when in fact they are just being who they are. So it goes on and on, and, and I was going to read another another one at the bottom. It says, uh, one commenter on the music video, uh, uh, which has been watched more than 500,000 times, I think, by now on YouTube. This is the parody we're talking about. Says, uh, no, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. This was, this was about the original one. Excuse me. Quote, I think you're hoping people receive it as satire, but the fact that you feel there's an audience for this song just proves to me that the church is way off base and straight up toxic. Don't sexualize your daughters and then preach at them as if they're causing it. Preach at the boys and men who feel entitled to sexualize them. So I guess this, this is what I started realizing. I, I'm way out of my, I'm way out of my element because everybody that I've shown this to, so my friends, my, uh, my church leaders, I said, have you heard about this controversy? And I showed it to them and they're like, everybody has said, I don't think I understand the controversy. Yeah. And I think what we're getting into is that 10 years ago, any dad, atheist, pagan, <laughs> hedonistic, it doesn't matter. Uh, any dad would be like, I don't understand what's wrong with this. Nobody wants their daughter dressing like Cardi B on TikTok. Right. Nobody wants that, much less a pastor. And so this is, it reminds me of um, 
I'll say this one thing and then I'm going to let you just go off, uh, Elisa, because uh, I, I need your advice. Yeah. But it reminds me of, I don't want to quote this wrong. I'm pretty sure this was from Nikki Six. Nikki Six was the bass guitar player for the band Motley Crue. For anybody that grew up when we grew up and listened to awesome music. And um, whoever the band was, it was a band like Motley Crue. It was in the hair metal time. And if people don't if, didn't grow up in the 80s and don't know what this is, this was an era of sex, drugs, rock and roll, yeah. okay? It, it idolized strip club culture. In fact, Motley Crue, one of their big songs was an ode to strip clubs all the way around the world. That song's called Girls, Girls, Girls. It was about the neon lights, right? And mm -hmm. they named strip clubs from all over the world. That's what the whole band was about. And he fam I'm pretty sure it was Nikki Six. If it wasn't him, it was someone in a band like that, Poison, War, whatever. But he, after he had a daughter, they said, so what do you want for your daughter? And he said, I feel like my sole mission in life is to keep my daughter off the pole. Oh, yeah. That, those are his yeah. words, okay? Yeah. This is someone that made his living. This is somebody, whoever it was, that's probably an atheist or agnostic, certainly not a Christian. But now we have pastors saying to their own daughters, you're a queen, wear whatever you want to wear, just go off on TikTok. Yeah. And I think that that's what made me sort of angry enough to give you a text like, what am I missing mm -hmm. about what is going on that, pa that any dad, a Christian dad would give his daughter that advice seems highly inappropriate to me. So yeah. I realize there are things I'm not understanding and I want to be gracious and I want to have you uh, talk to me <laughs> to learn me something. Learn me, Elisa. What's I'll try to learn you. <laughs> So, okay, so I think your confusion, you're not alone. Uh, in fact, on The Blaze, when The Blaze reported this, they, their headline was, Christian singer Matthew West issues apology, yanks video after Modest is Hottest song about his daughter's clothing and purity faces condemnation across the board. I don't think it did face condemnation across the board. I think you had some very, very loud voices from progressive Christian Twitter and YouTube and a whole lot of sort of Bible-believing Christians who are going, I don't understand what's happening. And uh, so in in trying to, when I first heard the song, I remember thinking, progressive Christian Twitter is not going to like this. They're, they're not going to like this song uh, because there's such a reaction against the purity culture of the, the 80s and 90s, even early 2000s. In fact, just to give people an inside look to the attitude toward purity culture. Many people will remember when fathers were giving their daughters these purity rings, and it was sort of this symbol to to the daughter would kind of make this promise to her father to, to stay pure until she's married. And of course, they weren't giving purity rings out to the guys, which is part of the part of the problem. And I, I think that's a valid uh, a valid critique of purity culture is that it seemed to be so focused on the females and not really focused on the males. Now, I think at the same time, though, nobody that I knew was saying, oh, guys, you can just go out and do whatever you want, but we're going to just try to keep the girls pure. I think it, it might that might have been the message people received. I don't think anybody was actually sending that message. But just to give a picture into how hated this idea was, and to be honest with you, I didn't love it either. I remember being in high school and my friends were all getting purity rings. And I remember thinking, I don't know if this is a good idea. Like, what if somebody falls and fails and what are they going to do? Are they, they're not going to give the ring back. They're probably just hide and, and start lying and kind of, you know, so I was concerned about it even back then. Um, but I think that just to give a picture, so Nadia Boltz Weber wrote a book on sexuality. She's a progressive Christian Lutheran minister, and she hates purity culture so much, like that purity culture that people our age kind of grew up in if you grew up in the church, that when she wrote her book on sexuality, she actually told women who had received purity rings in high school to send the purity rings into her, and she was going to have them melted down and then made into an image of a vagina. And she made the statue, like all these girls sent their purity rings, she made the statue, and then she presented it to feminist icon Gloria Steinem uh, as, as a gift and, and a thanks for her contribution to feminism. And so this is sort of the attitude, and it's there's a, a very much a hatred for purity culture. Now, here's what I, here's what I think about it. 
This is I posted this on Facebook to my followers uh, on my Patreon only page. I wrote, you know, doesn't it seem like culture is so deeply fundamentalist and utterly incapable of nuance? I mean, isn't it possible to encourage our daughters to dress modestly for lots of reasons, not just because of what it's going to do to guys, while at the same time helping them understand that they're not responsible for men's lust, like that's on men. And it seems like there's just this extreme overreaction to where, yes, we can agree there are things about purity culture that we can critique, that we can say, you know, that overshot scripture, that was not biblical. But we can do that without throwing the concept of purity out the window because that's a biblical concept. That's something that the Bible calls men and women to do is to be pure. Uh, Paul told Timothy to be an example in purity to the older believers and not let anyone look down on him because he was young. The Bible tells women in other places to to live uh, out of purity, for men to lift holy hands. And we're going to get into some of these scriptures, I think, in a moment. But uh, in my in my chapter in the Mama Bear Apologetics book, I used the example of a Newton's cradle. It's called, you've all probably seen one of these sitting on someone's desk where you have like the five metal balls on strings and then there's the ball in the middle and you take the one outside and you, the ball, and then it kind of clicks and then it makes the outside ball of the other side go out and then that comes and it just keeps going. Well, if you really look at a Newton's cradle, that middle ball doesn't move. So the the when the ball hits down, like the other ones kind of get ruffled a little bit, and it it sends this. I'm, I don't know the science behind it, but it makes the outside ball go out and come back. But I in the book I'm like, be that middle ball. Like don't just swing to far right and far left every time something crazy happens. Keep your worldview based on the Bible, which is going to have a lot of nuance around things like this. And so I do think it's possible for us to tell girls like, no, you shouldn't be on TikTok wearing whatever you want. And one of the saddest things about what this pastor said is that um, he's telling women, basically, you can dress however you want to, to express yourself. Well, the Bible just doesn't give you that permission. The Bible is going to get all up in your business if you're a man or a woman regarding how you talk, what you wear, how you conduct yourself. This is part of being a Christian is that we have the Bible as our authority, not the woke mob. And so I, I was just kind of sad to see that he took it down and, and apologized. And you could kind of tell from the apology, he wasn't sure maybe what happened to him. He kind of stepped in something like, I don't, I'm not totally sure, but I love my daughters. And um, and then I'll just say one more thing, and I'll throw it back to you, John. But one of the things that really sort of just made me super sad, because we both know Matthew. I mean, I don't know him super well, but I did some shows with him back in the day. He was a super nice guy. Uh, is that they're almost saying, like, this is so creepy that a dad would be trying to tell his daughters how to be hot. Well, this is just a principle. When you're interpreting what somebody has said, I think we should always interpret it in the most charitable light possible, right? I, this is what I try to do when I critique progressive Christianity. I try to, to, I try not to go to the worst possible motive they might have. In fact, I try to avoid motive altogether unless the motive is stated, and just go with the ideas. But it's like they're they're almost treating him like he's this creepy guy who wants his daughters to be hot. Well, think it through, everyone. If he's saying to his his daughters what the boys really like is a turtleneck, that's in reaction to the fact that, you know, they're probably looking at boys and boys are looking at them and they're trying to figure it all out. And he's going off of the fact that they probably are wanting to appear attractive to the opposite sex. And he's like, it's a joke. Oh, well, the boys really like a turtleneck. They really love the Mother Teresa look, you know. And so yeah. it's like he's not trying to instruct them to be hot. He's it, – it's, it's humor and – Interestingly, you know, my daughter really understood it. I, I talked with her after we couldn't find the song on the internet anymore. And then I found out what happened. So we were just sort of processing it. And I, and I said, what do you think about all that? And she goes, well, I think it's, she, she didn't understand it. She's like, I just think it's kind of stupid. I said, so do you feel like this song was telling you that boys, you know, you're responsible for how boys feel? And she's like, no, not at all. But see, that's because she doesn't have the baggage from purity culture. And so I think that's really the key. I think if we could really dissect this with a surgeon's scalpel, what we would get to is that it's okay to critique some, some missteps of purity culture without throwing the biblical concept of purity away. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have so much I, I think about, 
so many of the great things you just said, but I think what, what I find so disingenuous is that no one thinks that he's actually being creepy and telling right. his daughter, you really need to be hot. No one really believes that. And what I think sad about this um, is that, you know, I often tell people that every once in a while, somebody might say, John, I think that you've gotten too into politics or you've gotten too vocal about, I, I don't know, like a few months ago, you know, I got in a lot of hot water for what I said about Cardi B from the performance at the whatever Grammys. Mm -hmm. And and so we were like, John, you're getting your eyes off of like the gospel message and you're getting involved in these other things. What I think's really <laughs> pertinent about this Matthew West thing <laughs> is that, that I keep saying in my podcast, I don't want to be like that. It's just that I'm saying things that everyone agreed on until like five days ago. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, uh, like all of a sudden it's like, oh, um, if fathers aren't allowed to tell their, their daughter that I'd really rather you not wear a bikini on TikTok and start gyrating and right. or simulating sex on TikTok. I, I don't want you to do that as a father. Everybody agreed on that five minutes ago. And I, you know, I don't know Matthew very well. We know each other. We're friendly. Um, unlike, <laughs> unlike uh, Kevin Max, who commented on my podcast about a month ago that he's never met me before, Matthew's met me and remembers. All right, so we're friendly, <laughs> but we're not like buddy buddies, you know. But I know yeah. him well enough to know. I don't think in his brand, he he's not looking to be the fire starter. You know, I don't no, think he wants yeah. to come on and set something on fire and be like, you know, I told you. I don't think he wants to make enemies. I think he's just a nice. He, in fact, he's so nice that he qualified his statement about Cardi B in the song. <laughs> I know, and I thought that was really sweet. What a good it example to say. Look, we can reject her clothing and her behavior, but still recognize that she's a person made in the image of God and who is loved by God. And she can even be a nice person, but I just don't want you to dress like her. I don't want you to, to act like her. I, I mean, it's I'm sorry. Nice but nice qualification, if, Yeah, if it? you're a Christian, I mean, that's, here's the thing too, John, is, is there, I, I mentioned a bit earlier, it's like there's this fundamentalism in Christianity that often gets critiqued by people in progressive Christian Twitter and things like that, but they often react with their own fundamentalism that is so yeah. extreme and so dogmatic. Uh, it's almost like, you know, yeah, stay out of the Cardi B stuff. Don't criticize Cardi B or the K Kardashians or any of that because, you know, that's that's not the gospel. Well, guess what, guys? It is. It is the gospel. The gospel is holistic. When Jesus calls us, he says, you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross daily to follow him. It's a death. You are dying a death when you follow Jesus. And that means you die to how you want to always express yourself. And I think that's something that our culture doesn't really get. But I sort of just interrupted you. So I want you to keep going there. <laughs> Oh, I, I like it. Sounds like you're preaching. I love it when people <laughs> preach. You know, well, I, I, I find that that I feel bad for Matthew. Again, we're not best mates. I don't know Matthew that well. I feel like he stepped into something that he didn't quite understand. And I can't blame him for not understanding that. The first time I heard of what you call purity culture, I only heard of that a few years ago and, and me and Matthew might be the same age. I'm a little older than you, I think, Elisa. And so purity culture was a little after me. It, it's a little bit more like when I was in college. And so I, all of that uh, escaped me. And so I'd never really quite heard of it. But I, I, I want to say this one thing. We're going to get into some of the Bible stuff later. I want to say one thing and then I want to ask you a question if you don't mind. But um, I, I will say this one thing. The, the, what what the anti-purity culture folks, what what I agree with them about and what I know you agree with, but I just want to say it really bluntly. The idea that we blame girls for guys sinning, uh, me and the anti-purity culture people, you have an ally in me in that. Mm. I am sick and tired of the church downplaying uh, pornography, downplaying... Um, uh, I mean, lust of the flesh, masturbation, whatever you want to call it. There, sometimes there is a little bit of a sense of, hey, that's just going to be what life is. And there's a certain amount of that that, that everybody's going to do. It's like speeding. 
everybody's going to speed sometimes. It's just something that we're okay to deal with to a certain degree. And we're not here to talk about that today, but I am really tired of that. And I, and I very much disagree with it. And I just want to mention it now because a lot of guys uh, watch Cooper stuff and I've mentioned it before, but I want to be really clear about it. I believe that it should be the norm in the church to have victory. I mean, complete victory over, uh, pornography, masturbation, lust of the flesh, whatever you want to call it, Jesus lived that life. And do we not have the spirit of Christ in us? I am really tired of that. And I, I hear it all the time, even with people that I respect, there's a little bit of a, hey, you got to have grace for this. And I'm not saying we don't have grace, but I want to hold that standard up. So me and the anti-purity culture movement people, I, I can give them an amen that you should not go. I don't care what a woman dress is like this is my dominion right here. Mm. Okay. This is my dominion all up in here. And that's on me. And I'm tired of people. I'm tired. I'm just, I'm so sick of the soft pedaling of kind of like a little bit is okay. It ain't okay. And, and the spirit of Christ is why you are more than a conqueror. The Bible says, so I can amen them with that. But what I want to ask you, if you don't mind is, is this, are you alarmed? Let's see because I don't know much about purity culture. I found it alarming when the stuff that you just read me that some people had said and, and, and what I read you that this pastor said, so much of that sounds like modern psychology or even radical feminism. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound like Christianity to me. And am I right about that? It, it sounds an awful lot like third wave feminism to me, almost like women just need to be able to do whatever they want That's to do. Right almost like in a denial of like human nature or something weird like that. Like we have nothing to do with men and, and the Bible doesn't teach that, but am I reading that correctly? Yeah. In fact, it's so funny that you would ask me that right now because I just pulled up some notes on the history of feminism because I think that this is deeply rooted in third heading into fourth wave feminism. And so for, if anyone's unfamiliar with the history of feminism. So you're saying that I am right. I think you're right. I yes. do. I think All you're right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we hear the word feminism mm. and that's, it, people can think a hundred different things when they think about it. So when f the first wave, feminism is often sort of broken up into these three, some, some people even say we're in a fourth wave now of mm. feminism. And so, you know, the first wave being in the 1700s <clears throat> through the 1900s and largely speaking, the first feminist, now there were, there were others, but the, for the most part, the early feminists were pro-life. They were against abortion, but they were trying to get rights to vote. They were trying to get the right to, to go to college and have an education and to own property. These were things that um, really would fall into the realm of having equal rights. And so I think, you know, from that perspective, we can say that was a really good thing that happened. You know, I'm glad that my daughter can go to college. I'm glad that, that I can own property as a woman and uh, that I don't have to depend on uh, the men in my life for my, you know, survival, essentially. This is all, these are all very good things. Then we saw a second wave happen where it took on a bit of a different flavor. So this would be around the 1960s, around the time of the se uh, sexual revolution, when feminism, you know, they, they earned those rights, they won those rights, education, property, right to vote. And now it became workplace equality and reproductive rights. And so women were now beginning to feel like, man, me having to stay home and take care of the house, take care of the kids, that's oppressive to me as a person. And so they wanted, you know, they were advocating for equal pay and stuff like that. And some of that was good too. But then the reproductive rights started to become the center point of the conversation of feminism. So essentially, you you have this being viewed more as a justice issue because when a woman gets pregnant, of course, things have to change in her life. She can't necessarily work while she's got a newborn or while she's in the throes of pregnancy or whatever it might be. Well, that's not fair because men don't have to do that. So those things became largely cir circled around the freedom to have sex with who you wanted, when you wanted, without ramifications, okay? Yeah, so then right. it moved into like a third wave that was about the 80s 
until now. And some people, again, say that maybe there's a fourth wave, too, because the third wave, I believe, was the one that was kind of critiquing the second wave as being largely white women, middle class. It was focused around white middle class women. So what happened in the 80s and beyond is rather than these individual rights, it, it, oppression began to be viewed as a system. And this is when we have the whole patriarchy is evil, let's crush the patriarchy, that whole thing. And so really any sort of hierarchy between men and women became viewed as oppressive. Well, now we have a problem, though, biblically speaking, because biblically there is hierarchy between men and women. The Bible describes, and I know I'm about to say, it's funny that what I'm about to say runs more of a chance of people trying to cancel you than what Matthew West did. But you know, the Bible, <laughs> the Bible tells women to submit to their husbands. Yes, it tells husbands also, though, to love their wives as Christ loved the church. We always skip over that and go right to the wife submitting to the husband. But there's a hierarchy in the home, the husband being the, the head of the home. And I think when people are doing this right and doing it biblically, the man flourishes and the woman flourish and the kids flourish the most when everybody's doing it right. Now, if you get some jerk in there that's, you know, holding everything over his wife's head, and a lot of women do have to go through that, uh, granted for sure, but that's, he's failing on his end if he's, if he's lording things over her and being abused to her or oppressive to her in that sense. Um, but because we've been so steeped in this second and third and possibly fourth wave feminism as a culture, it's like what they saw on, you know, the awards show with Cardi B or that the Super Bowl with, I believe it was Shakira and J-Lo, where some people were like, wait a second, this, you know, um, is that for a woman to be able to dress, uh, you know, provocatively and dance provocatively, that's viewed because of this feminism as empowerment, that that's viewed as a woman uh, coming into her power. Uh, but again, as Bible-believing Christians, as people, we have a different worldview. We have a different authority. And so, I, I don't know, maybe this would be a good time to, to go into some of the scriptures on this, because I don't know if maybe people have forgotten what the Bible says about some of this stuff. But the Bible has a lot to say about what followers of Jesus. You're so nice. I, mean, I don't think that people have forgotten. I think people don't care. But yeah. I hear what you're saying, and you're <laughs> nice. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, I'll just read you some of these. So 1 Timothy 2.9 mm. says, Likewise also women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly attire. Now, this is one of those verses that hyper-legalistic uh, sections of Christianity have taken uh, to say, you know, if you wear jewelry, you're in sin. That's not what this verse is saying. It's it's saying you should be you should be appropriate in the way that you're presenting yourself and not be like, you know, blinged out and making that be the biggest thing about you. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, this is written to men and women. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You, you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. And then we have, uh, this is written to women as well, 1 Peter 3, 3 through 4. It said, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let you, now obviously it doesn't mean don't wear clothing, right? It's saying don't let your, <laughs> your attractiveness come from that. But let your adorning, let your beauty be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which which is in God's sight, very precious. Now talk about countercultural telling women that God finds a gentle and quiet spirit precious. You know, this, this is why people honestly are trying to cancel the Bible. Proverbs 31 says, charm is deceitful, beauty is vain. A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Proverbs 11, 22, like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. And Deuteronomy, of course, this is Old Testament, but the, the principle would apply. A woman shall not wear a man's garment, or nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. Uh, so, so God has a lot to say about what yeah. we're, we're dressing like. And I want to just look at that 1 Timothy 2 uh, verse in, in context a little bit here, because we just said what it says to the women. But it says here, I desire then that in every place the men <clears throat> should pray. Now, this is to men. Lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. 
Now, John, if every man in America just did that, everything would change, right? Holy hands, meaning not hands looking at pornography, Mm -hmm. not pulling up, you know, sexting with people, not given to anger or quarreling. Holy hands as you pray without anger or quarreling. Then it says to the women that you should adorn yourselves in respectable apparel. It has something very strong to say to to both men and women. And again, our culture hates this. Our, our cult, the, to, to our culture, yeah. this is oppressive. And I think that's where things start really going off the rails and how everybody's responding to this. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. Those are, I'm so glad you looked up those scriptures. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that it's very difficult to, once you buy into the, the, secular, the secular philosophies, if you if, if that's what you have bought into as your ultimate truth the patriarchy what have you once you bring that into the bible you're you're i always like to say you're basically going to have a war of the gods right you have the god of the bible and then you have the god of secularism or the god of what you know whatever you, whatever you you want to call that and now your gods are at war and which one is going to win out and if you are given to modern uh, psychology or um, third wave feminism or what have you, all of a sudden you're gonna you're gonna be at a, at a really bad place because the Bible doesn't the, the Bible doesn't make allowances for the idea that you can do anything that you want to do just to be yourself. Like this idea of whatever makes you feel good, you should be allowed to do it. The Bible makes no such allowances um, about that, and one of the reasons I wanted to make so clear that I, I do, I am hard on men about this is because I do agree with you. Men are, it's not popular to say, but we are supposed to be leading. We are supposed to be, we are supposed to be leading by example. We are supposed to be the one protecting our wives, our daughters, our sisters, and, 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 and not just our familial sisters, but our sisters in, in Christ. We are supposed to be leading the charge on that. And I think you're right. I think if all of a sudden men really understood that I am to present my body as a living sacrifice, th- that really changes things. And I think that a lot of the times we just don't view the Bible as as big of a deal as it is. The Bible, the word of God, when God said, this is the standard, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord that would change a whole lot of stuff. Then we would be leading by example. And that's why I want to be so clear that I do want to be hard on the men out there watching, the young men watching this podcast, the young boys watching this podcast. It ain't popular to say, but you're supposed to be leading in love and leading in purity. That's the kind of leading that I believe God calls us to do. Uh, True leadership is service. And that's what you're doing. You are serving your sisters in Christ. And you're, you're, you're making an example of that. But also really can't stand how how the the secularist point of view and really the what I would call the utopianist or the utopian vision, whatever you want to call it, and that um, you know I don't like how they want to try to re- they try to remove human nature from everything, and so mm-hmm. part of this for me as a dad, I have an uh, eighteen year old daughter, she's eighteen now, but part of this is is protection for for my for my daughter not because every single guy out there is as would you say a sex crazed maniac <laughs> but but part of this is it, it, it's multifaceted but to act like the way that you present your body male or female the way that you present your body is a non issue to the lord uh, th- that that's not correct. It is an issue to the Lord. Yeah. And the way that you present your body and your sexuality, male and female, to your brothers and sisters in Christ at your youth group or whatever, to say that the Bible doesn't speak to that is, is really silly. And furthermore, as a parent, to not try to protect your daughter. Every woman knows this. Every woman watching this is going to amen it. And I only know it because I'm married and I have a daughter that feeling that girls get when they are being looked at in a way that they do not want to be looked at. I hate that it happens, but it happens. And when, you know, I have a daughter and she's had that feeling of, I don't even want to see that person because he always looks at me like, you know, fill in the blank. I want to help protect my daughter from that. 
and, mm-hmm. and to act like that there is nothing to be said about it from some of these the Christian. I expect the world to do crazy stuff, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but to it's like um, there's a guy called A.D. Robles, a uh, Christian uh, reformed guy. He always has this great phrase that I like. He always says, pagans going to peg. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> as I, I expect pagans to peg. But when you see Christians kind of I, I got to be honest with you, I'm not trying to be rude to anybody. I was dismayed at the amount of Christian moms. It was mainly moms mm. freaking out mad at Matthew West to think that parents don't have something to say about this really brings question to me about this is what I want to ask you because you know more about it. Do you think do you think that some of these people actually care about I'm not talking about purity culture. Do you think they care about purity or do you think that the whole idea of purity is kind of antiquated? Do, does that make sense? Yeah. I don't know I, if I'm saying it right. I do. I do think that in the minds of many people, the concept of purity is antiquated. And I'll just, I'll kind of reference back to uh, Nadia Boltz Weber's book because her book, Shameless on Sexuality, in my view and in my experience, it was endorsed by lots of big progressive Christian authors. And that's really something she argues in the book is that purity is, uh, in fact, she says purity often leads to to pride uh, or to despair, not holiness. And, be, and oh, she's, weird. she's okay. def- well, because it's how she defines words. And I think this has seeped in even to the broader Christian culture so much. So she talks about the word, she, she pits holiness and purity like, as if they're two opposite concepts. Whereas biblically, I didn't do a deep dive earlier today, but I was kind of looking on logos and, you know, what is purity? What is, they're really deeply connected. Being pure is, is in a state, as far as the best I can understand it, biblically speaking, how the word is used in the Bible, it really has to do with living in um, a cleanliness before God. Now, of course, as Christians, we know that we are, our righteousness is filthy rags. We can't do it on our own. We need Jesus. We need his blood atonement. We need that covering of his blood to cleanse us from our sins. That when God looks at us, you know, Jesus' righteousness is like placed on us like a garment. God looks at us and sees the righteousness of Jesus. So it's not about what we're doing, but like you mentioned, like there there should be a trajectory to toward becoming more and more like Christ if you're yes. really a Christian. Now, for some people, that's going to look a lot slower depending on the the trauma they've had in the past, maybe some of the woundings they've had. Maybe there have been people who have been sexually abused and there's just a whole bunch of knots tangled up in that. And like, that's where we just have so much grace and, and compassion. But, but as we walk in our lives with Christ, even if it's just a little bit, there should be evidence of us becoming more and more like Christ every day so that when we look back a year a year ago, I'm a little different this year than I was yes. last year. My mind has been transformed since last year. I might still struggle with certain stuff, but but the Lord's working on me. He's, he's taking That's me right. along. And so purity is like, <clears throat> uh, the best I can understand it biblically, it's sort of living in that state of holiness. It's, it's moving toward holiness, but Nadia Boltzweber has separated purity from holiness, more describing purity as um, sort of this legalism. And then holiness she describes as unity, really between any, anyone or with God. And so that's why she can describe any sort of erotic embrace between two human beings as holy, because she's defined it that way. But that everybody needs to understand, that is not how holiness is used in the Bible. That is not the biblical definition. In fact, the biblical definition is the opposite of that. Holiness, God's holiness means he can have no unity with sin. He's entirely separated from sin. And so... Um, so yeah, so even in this book, she teaches that telling people to wait until they get married to have sex is sort of just the remnants of this purity culture that's very damaging to their sexual uh, growth and thriving. And so I think so much of this has gotten into the broader Christian ideas that we're more informed by culture about sexuality than we are by the Bible. And th- of course, there's tons of pressure from all directions, but uh, I-, I definitely think that that that, that's an interesting thing to pit purity against holiness, as if purity is sort of this man-centered, and, and I'm trying to find in the book exactly how she uh, defines it, um, 
because again, according to purity culture, and she's she's quoting Joshua Harris, who of course now is not claiming to even be a Christian anymore, but you know, refraining from even kissing someone until you kiss your spouse at the wedding altar was was true purity, according to to purity culture. And if that's honestly the way that they're describing it, you know, may, maybe they overshot that. You know, it's like um, we can certainly, like we said. We can critique some of the missteps of purity culture and yet hold on to God's definition of yeah. sexuality, purity, and holiness. Absolutely. Uh, this is a couple, a couple of notes for people like me that are watching. <laughs> 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 this is why I sometimes say you don't have to be super smart to understand the Bible because anybody that is not that intelligent would read the Bible and they would read a word like purity and they would pretty much know what it means. Yeah. <laughs> People get so smart that they get dumb. And mm. it's like, hey, you don't need to understand, you know, this and this. No, we all kind of know what purity means, guys. And I, I, th th that kind of stuff. People start playing word games. It makes me just like, you know, I, I don't think that the gospel is meant to be for people that that, that are well, I don't mean that the gospel is not meant for smart people, but in other words, you don't have to be a certain IQ, have a certain IQ to understand how right. to, to live for Christ. And I want to really amen something you said, because I, I really love it. You just were talking about that journey in Christ. Once you're a new creation, you look back a year later and you say, okay, I've made some steps here. And I like that you said that. And I, there's a verse that I really love. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I was looking actually when you're talking, and all of a sudden I can't, ah, I can't find it. But what is the scripture that says that if we? It basically says that if we sin, he he's faithful to forgive us. I can't remember it's, what it is. Right uh, now. Second, I think it's Second John two. I'm going to look it up really quick because this is a. Or maybe it's First John two, but it says um, I just memorized this and now it's left me. Um, but yeah, it says don't say you're without sin. But when we do sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I'm gonna faithful and just. I'm googling. <laughs> Come on, Google it. Do first it John. I to... It's First John one nine. If we confess our sins okay. to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. Yes. I love it. That is what I was. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. You know, I, I love what you just said there. And, and, and the reason I like it is because I do here, here's what I'm not into. I am not into the idea that, that we lower the bar to such, such a degree that we're just kind of like, Hey, it's just all about loving God, you know, but, but we don't understand that loving God means to obey his words. Yeah. But, but I agree with you that he is faithful and just to forgive us. And we, that is the grace of God is the grace of God that he doesn't just, he doesn't just like give you everything that you need to change for the rest of your life all at one time, because you're such a, we're all such miserable failures. We'd be so overwhelmed. We don't know where to start. And he gives us, he gives us what we need and every day is going to be a battle. And, but, but a year later you look back and, and, and see it. And, but I always want to encourage people, but we, that's true. And we, but we still have the goal of, I am doing my, I'm doing all that I can do by the power of the spirit in order to, to be, to be faithful and to, to reach that goal. And I really like that. You know, you just said something that reminded me of what I was trying to say earlier. I don't know if I said it very well because I'm kind of ADD and I'm learning from you and I should not be learning. I should just be talking anyway. <laughs> so, um, but, but I want to say this, what I was saying about, uh, basically what I'm saying is this, I don't think Matthew quite knew what he was getting into, but I want this to be an encouragement for people watching this because yeah. in other words, I think that normal people, all of us lay folks, all of us lay people, you're going to be getting into these kind of things without knowing it. In other words, it's pretty hard to say neutral when the world has lost its ever loving mind. Yeah. And it's not just the world losing their mind. Now you have this, you have the progressive Christianity and progressive Christianity is subtly infiltrating mainstream Christianity. Like you talked about relevant magazine. I wish that we had time. I wish that relevant had time to list the full name of their, 
uh, of their publication that I gave them, which is relevant to the world, irrelevant for the gospel. But it's a really long title. But relevant magazine, I can't. I, I'm just like it's that kind of stuff that makes it. They make it sound like it's mainstream Christianity. It is not. It is infiltrating with ideas that are not from the Bible. They are mm. from outside. Really, they are from outside of, of historical Christianity, and they are they are coming in. And what's encouraging to my faith is when I see all those people come against me or come against Matthew in this case. And when I find out that some of those people that are coming against them go, hey, purity's different thing than holiness. And I'm like, I wish I had known that to start with because I wouldn't have spent so much time bothered by what they said because mm. I realized they're, they're outside of my worldview. They're outside of, it's not that I hate them. I don't hate them, but and I'll listen to them, but they are outside of what we believe. Yeah. And so I don't really, I don't really care. I'll listen to them. I will engage with them, but I don't really care. And that should strengthen people who, who are so confused and feeling, am I the crazy one? No, you're not the crazy one. We're just yeah. being you know, like this. And so one of the things I want to say, and then you can say whatever you like, you could fill, fill, fill this in is this, that. I want to ask you a, 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 a genuine question here. You see, I do know that there are people that have suffered under, what may, for instance, maybe under purity culture. Maybe there are people who have actually lived in some sort of abusive situation yeah. where people were told they were, I've read these things online. They were, uh, I don't, I'm not trying to shock anybody, but they say, I was told I was a whore for the way that I dressed and, mm -hmm. and this and that and the other. I mean, I obviously hate that, okay? I've never seen that happen. But here's what I want to get at, and here's what I wonder. For every person that says that who, who actually did suffer, it seems to me, and maybe I'm just cynical, but it seems to me that there's a thousand people who say they also were abused, but they don't they didn't really go through the actual abuse that that the real victims did. It just seems that it's becoming in vogue to say, I heard a bad thing said one time and I was abused too. And the reason I say I'm cynical about it is not to, to diminish the fact that some people have actually suffered and you probably would have an ally mm -hmm. in me if I understood your story. But I know a dozen people personally who all say that they have suffered spiritual abuse. I know them. I was there. I saw what they suffered mm -hmm. and all that it was was Christian leadership doing their job saying, hey, you, you've you, you've said that you're a Christian. You said you're born again. You're under me as a as a shepherd. You know, I'm the person that's supposed to shepherd you and care for your life. And your life is not actually adding up to what we believe. And they were bringing correction. That's not just something that church leadership should do. That's something the body does. I mean, mm. that's I'm supposed to do that with my friend, I mean, faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? Mm -hmm. That's not just church leadership. That's actually just what the body's supposed to do. And some people haven't liked it. And some of those things have been on sexuality, or gender issues, on X, Y, Z. Yeah. And then they're like spiritual abuse. And I've seen, I know a dozen people like this, but out of that dozen people, I think 10 of them have all either said they're no longer Christians or they've deconstructed. They certainly don't seem like Christians and they are in a battle against the church claiming yeah. that they are abused. And I guess what I want to ask you is, is am I being too cynical about this or is there a little bit of this victim culture that is playing mm -hmm. into this? Yeah. I, okay. So this, there's a lot to unpack there and this is actually something that I've been given been giving a ton of thought to lately, but I all, but I want to go back before I answer that and just affirm what you're saying there about the encouragement to everybody, because when we see what happened to Matthew West, I, I just, I look at this and I go, man, everybody's just going to have to choose, right? Like all of us as Christians, you're going to have to choose. Are you going to bow to the woke mob or are you going to bow to Jesus? Because yes. the woke, woke mob is not going to like, they're not going to, if anybody from the woke mob listens to this podcast, they're going to have a lot to say about it. And I do hope that this podcast will spark some conversations. 
But what I hope people don't miss is what you've said. Look, you've got an ally in me if you've been through genuine abuse. I, I think it's wrong that, you know, if you let men off the hook for their lust and blame the women, that's wrong. We're, we're, we're saying all that. But what you're saying about abuse here, I think, is extremely important because it's something I've been trying to work through myself, both as someone who has experienced some spiritual abuse, walked with people who have experienced legitimate spiritual abuse, abuses of, of, of power, bully pastors who wield their power in manipulative and narcissistic fashions. Like, I want to just say full stop, that exists. It's out there. It stinks to God. It stinks according to the Bible. And the Bible has a lot to say about abusive pastors and abusive shepherds, full stop. At the same time, though, we do have this victim culture. It becomes very hard to parse between true abuse and when somebody just feels abused because they don't like the message. And so one example, I think, if people are like, what is this all about? One example I can give you is the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, the idea that God the Father required the blood sacrifice of his only son. In progressive circles, this is referred to as cosmic child abuse. And uh, I've talked with progressive Christians on Twitter who will say just that doctrine is abusive. It abuses people. So if you've ever been told that, you've been abused. And so when you sort of oversimplify abuse and define it that way, what you're really doing, first of all, like you said, you're promoting this victim culture, but you're also uh, really diminishing the real abuse that people have walked through, whether it be sexual or abuses of power. A lot of these things are coming to light now, and I'm thankful. I just want God to shine all of his light on it. But we have to hold fast to what abuse actually is versus if you just don't like a particular teaching from the Bible. And so I think we need to parse that stuff really carefully. And actually, this makes me think of, of a line from the Newsweek article. Now, I'm going to quote the the pastor who I, I tried to look up his church. I couldn't find it. I'm going to assume he's more on the progressive side of things, the one that was writing the parody about Matthew's song, telling girls to basically dress however they want and express themselves and get out, get on the TikTok and do your thing and all that. He said here, Telling them to dress a certain way to be less attractive is reverse body shaming. We are, in essence, telling them that they should be uncomfortable with who they are because of what others, namely men, think of their body. Now, I'm going to be, I'm going to try to be as charitable as I can here, but I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this is such an immature view of what's actually going on. I think I want to say something also that that it, it of course is going to make some people mad, but that's kind of what I do. Nobody needs to hold Elisa accountable for what I'm about to say. Okay. No, um, and I'll try to be charitable. I'll go to but, full you know, screen on you. <laughs> <laughs> Elisa's going to get a coffee. Um, yeah, no, I mean, look, I remember when my, my daughter was probably four and my daughter was always like a lot of daughters. All she was already, like speaking full sentences by 12 months old, you know, and she always had this crazy emotional intelligence. So I began talking to my daughter about fairly deep things by the time she was three. She was always aware, always, and she was very spiritual, uh, very spiritually minded. So when she was about four years old, she had done something wrong. And so I had to discipline her. And so I had a talk with her about the scripture. The Lord disciplines those he loves. Mm. How wonderful it is to be disciplined by God. Because if God takes the time to discipline you, it means that you are someone that he loves. And he is doing that for your own good. And I explained to her, of course, what a dad would about why we discipline children. Why does it matter? You're saving them from perhaps physical harm. You know, don't run in the street. You might get hurt physically or spiritual harm, or you may be hurting someone else. And so it is my job as a man under authority of God, then then part of my authority means that I need to discipline you as my daughter. And if I don't discipline you, it means that I will be disciplined by my father, uh, meaning God, right? So I was explaining this to my daughter and I said, this is how you know that I love you, uh, honey, because I, I'm taking the time to discipline you and explain to you what you should do. And if I didn't take the time to discipline you, then that means that I'm not being a loving dad. And so I remember about three months later, I had taken my daughter my, uh, to the park and she was running around and playing. And she runs up to me and she's like, dad, she's like whispering, dad, 
do you see that kid over there? I said, yeah. And she's like, his, his dad is sitting right over there. His dad hates her or hates him. His dad hates him. And I was like, his dad hates him. <laughs> and she says, yes, he keeps going and pushing the other kids and his dad refuses to discipline him. Oh, <laughs> and I was yes. like, oh, and I said, well, I don't know if you'd say necessarily that the dad hates him. And she's like, but the Lord disciplines those he loves. Mm. And if they don't discipline you, then what does that mean? And so I, of course, you know, did what every godly dad was. I said, go play. And when we get home, we ask your mother. <laughs> that's what every good, that's what every godly man does. We'll ask your mom for that one. But you know, the point was, is that even my daughter picked up on the fact that if you love your child, then you bring discipline. Yes. And I want to, I just want to encourage dads, moms, whoever watching, that is what a godly parent does. And A, if you don't bring discipline to your kids and you don't train your kids in the way they should go, you dads out there, you don't train your child in the fear and admonition of the Lord, then you are to be disciplined by your father. And that's, uh, I don't mean I want to be frightening, but it's a little frightening. And mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a, that's a, that's a gut check. You know, that is a gut check. But also God teaches us what it is to be a loving father and a loving father says this might not be comfortable this might be a hard conversation to have with my child a boy or a girl but that's what a loving that's what a loving parent should do and i just want to say this this is what might make somebody mad i don't want to be uncharitable to the the pastor in oklahoma city but when i read that i i, I thought okay this is moving to that area of i don't want to say he hates his daughters that's mm -hmm. that's over the line obviously that was my daughter my daughter's four-year-old interpretation. Yeah. Sure. But there's some truth to what my four-year-old daughter's interpretation is, which is a, you don't love your child enough to go over them and tell them you don't go and push other kids. There's yeah. a lot of reasons you don't do that. You don't love them enough to take the time to do it. That's not what a loving parent does. Yeah. So th this idea that we are being taught and we, we see this in the teachings of intersectionality. We see it in the teachings of oppressors and oppressed and various things. A lot of Christians don't know this, but you know, uh, on the list of oppressors in America, Christianity is on the list, yeah. but parents are also on the list mm -hmm. because that is in the worldview, the neo-Marxist worldview that parents are the ones that are stealing power from children. Yeah, That's the neo-Marxist worldview. That kind of sounds like what that guy is saying. It's a mixture of feminism, mm. modern feminism, I should say, a mixture of feminism with this neo-Marxism that's telling you there's a better way than what the Bible tells you. So I want to encourage you parents out there, there is no better way to train your kids than what the Bible says. And that's really good. And, you know, just something that that I was thinking, I mean, while, while we're kind of like Thelma and Louise here going off the cliff in a blaze of glory, <laughs> according to everything <laughs> we're saying here, uh, I just, I, I want to take it a bit further because, you know, the Bible, and this is something I've been talking with my kids about, is that the Bible actually has a lot to say about your the the spirit with it you know in which you convey yourself it talks about a haughty spirit it talks about pride it talks about having an arrogant heart and i think that we really need to think about you know when we're telling our daughters to go on tiktok and just do whatever you want wear whatever you want like are we factoring in what the bible says about how you should be conveying yourself. Like, I'll just read some of these. Proverbs 16, 18. I mean, this is one I had my kids memorize. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. Uh, it, it says, Proverbs 26, do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? In other words, they think he's hot stuff. Uh, is there more hope for a fool? That There's more hope for a fool than for him. Um, when when it, it talks about the end times, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, disobedient, abusive, ungrateful, unholy. Uh, Proverbs 16 says, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Proverbs 21 says, haughty eyes uh, and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked are sin. 
And, and the Bible talks about not being puffed up with conceit, but in humility count other people more significant than yourselves. As we read through some of these things, and then you think about what some people are advocating, saying to young girls, like, however you feel, whatever you feel you are, like, just let that shine. Like, don't let anybody uh, oppress you by telling you that you need to put on more clothes or something like that. I think it's just really sad because when we really have a biblical worldview, what we see is that our bodies are precious to God and they're worth protecting. And and I think that just this message that we're seeing in culture, that the message that I think has infected the church to where, you know, progressive Twitter would try to cancel Matthew over this song is, is what we're seeing, sort of just this, this shunning of the idea of humility and trying at least to not have a haughty spirit and and try to to be humble and and live quiet peaceable lives and and to love Jesus. I don't know. It just there just seems to be such a disconnect between some of the things I just read and then some of the messaging that we're seeing from people who were opposed to to Matthew's song. I agree with that. And I and I'll add to it a tiny bit that and it's the reason that when I read a lot of the, the things that, that those people are saying the re the reason I can dismiss it so easily because I I kind of go, in some ways they don't sound like they've, um, frankly, uh, understood lordship what lordship actually means because mm. part of it to me is also one of identity, you know which is that when you give your life to Christ, that's what defines you. You're a new creation. You, you, the all the old has passed away. The fact that you that you still find your identity in. The, the way you look, the way you dress, my own expression, the music I like, my intelligence or my gift for sports, or that's not your identity anymore. Jesus is the Lord of your life and he's the Lord of every, every aspect of your life. It's kind of like that great Puritan Lordship model, you mm. know, Jesus is Lord of all. And I find that this idea of like, express you and every whatever whoever you are it's because it's what you feel it's like that's that's like not a thing in christianity what the thing in christianity is that it's a call to die it's just it's a call to die pick up your cross follow me uh as my friend james white calls it on the death march mm -hmm. <laughs> as you carry your cross up to golgotha yeah. you know you're about to be put to death and the good news is that a new creation is 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 now uh, you're a new creation basically and another thing i find really weird about it is how so much of the progressive christianity so much of this stuff is so obviously harmful mm -hmm. uh, like even a lot of secular thinkers that are that are atheistic or what humanistic even i've read tons of those people going hey actually all this social media is not actually good for our kids. <laughs> it's yeah. like not actually good for them to live a life going, you know, with this phone in my hand going, I just need everybody to like me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I need to be as beautiful as someone else, at, you know, putting all your filters and taking your wrinkles off. And now all the, the, the in fact, they're saying it's mainly bad for girls, even more than guys because of beauty standards and mm. every everything looks fake. So everybody has to appear fake in order to be as beautiful as someone else. And people saying what would be best for our teenagers is to not go on those platforms at all. Mm. But you've got <laughs> people saying you need to go on there and, and just let your flag fly. Yeah. And I'm kind of like, even, even the atheist social scientists are coming, are saying this stuff is bad. This isn't good for who they are. Uh, I find that kind of, I don't know. You think that's interesting? It's I do. very interesting. In fact, I was just reading, uh, I just downloaded Jonathan Haidt's book, um, The Righteous, is it The Righteous Mind, I think it's called? And, I do think it's called that. Yeah. So I listened to a, a podcast that he was on. And again, this, he's an atheist. So like, this isn't somebody that's going to the Bible saying, you know, let's do purity culture uh, or, you know, ab about all this social media stuff. But he was saying that that it's really affecting girls, like you said, uh, up to two hours, beyond two hours of screen time is leading to increased depression uh, and all this stuff, especially in girls. So if, you know, even if you take the whole purity, I think, and put it to the side, I mean, just to, to give your kids like, oh yeah, go on TikTok and just 
do what you want. Um, this is this is not good for them. This is not healthy yeah. for them, even from an atheist perspective. And and I think that that's that's something that. But again, in this fundamentalist, progressive, woke culture, there's there's just no. It seems to be like there's no ability to think in nuance about these things. Yes. Uh, you know, I think you and I would both agree with this progressive pastor who says, don't sexualize your daughters and then preach at them if it, as if they're causing it. Preach at the boys and men who feel entitled to sexualize with them, sexualize them. Like, I agree with that. But the fact that they're interpreting that that's what Matthew was doing in his song, that's where I think the disconnect is. And um, so anyway, I, I I don't know. We're at, we're at about an hour here. John, do you, do you have any closing thoughts for us or <laughs> anything else you feel like you didn't get to say? <laughs> <laughs> The only thing I no, the only thing I would reiterate is something that you said earlier because I'm just fine. I want to reiterate it every single week now. <laughs> don't try to appease, do not try to appease these people. You're going, uh, we're all going to find ourselves, unfortunately, at war, even when we don't want to be at war. Uh, like, and I don't want to, I don't like confrontation to tell you the truth. Personally, yeah. I actually kind of hate it. I don't like people getting mad at me and calling me names and, uh, this and the other, but you're, you're not going to really be able to get away from you because you're going to step in landmines all the time without knowing it. And I just want to encourage people to know that that's here or that it's coming for you eventually, doesn't mean you have to jump in the fight and get on social media and start screaming at people. I'm not saying that, but but in your heart and in what you believe, I just would say refuse to back down an inch to the woke mob because in the end, for the most part, I'm not saying there's no one, but for the most part, they're not actually given to historical Christianity. They're not really given to like traditional Orthodox theology and saying that is the standard and whatever the Bible says goes. They're not really into that. They just try to twist things. They try to use it if they think they can win an argument against you. So I would just tell people, do not back down one inch, refuse to tell lies. You know, that's, that's what I would say. That's so good. And it reminds me even of when Jesus was before Pilate, just before he was crucified. I mean, we have a mob. We have a mob mentality happening there. Uh, you know, there's Barabbas and there's Jesus. And, you know, Pilate says to the to the mob, to the crowd, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And, you know, because he perceived it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered Jesus up. Uh, but the chief priests were in the crowd. They were stirring people up to have them release uh, but Barabbas instead. And so Pilate asked again, what shall I do with the man uh, you call the king of the Jews? And they all cried out, the, the mob, the whole big crowd, crucify him. And Pilate's like, why? What evil has he done? And they shouted all the more, crucify him. And so Pilate, listen to this people, wishing to satisfy the crowd released yeah. Barabbas and had Jesus scored and delivered, scourged and delivered him to be crucified. Pilate wanted to satisfy the crowd. And I think that this is a cautionary tale, tale for us. You know, we're going to come up against the mob. We're going to come up against, we, you know, you might be the only person left in your, in your area with a biblical worldview, but we just, we have to follow Christ as Christians and we have to be ready to to endure what the world's going to say about us. Now, look, if, if somebody criticizes me for saying something ungodly, unbiblical, too, you know, maybe too harsh or something like that, I always want to look at that and look at myself and say, you know, did I sin against somebody when I said that? Did I uncharitably interpret something? I'm constantly doing that. And, you know, I'm, I hope and pray that I would be the first one to say, look, I, I blew it here. That was sin, and I'm sorry. Um, but we can't apologize for biblical biblical truth. We just can't. Paul said when they spread the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ to some, it smelled like life and to some it smelled like death. But our job is to keep smelling that fragrance. It, it's, it has a smell. The gospel has a smell. And to some yes. people it stinks and to some people it smells good. And it's not just getting into heaven. It's a holistic thing. It's all of you. It's yes. Jesus becomes your Lord and you are following him and becoming transformed by the renewing of your mind every day to become more and more like Christ. And so uh, the world's going to hate that. It hated him. Jesus said, they're going to hate you like they hated me. And so I think that's just maybe that encouragement to leave our viewers with that the mob's going to come against you at some point, uh, maybe in your job or on social media or, or somewhere. Um, 
you know, let's all be willing to look at ourselves. And if we've sinned, if we've done something wrong, to be the first people to repent and apologize. But we can't repent for the gospel. And yeah. the world's always going to hate it. So that's that's sort and of it my smells good to thoughts. me right now. Yeah, I it can smells smell so it good. Now. Can you smell it? I it's can beautiful. smell it now, baby. Yes, it's, it's beautiful. Life. <laughs> that's awesome. So, John, I where can people it. connect with you online? Let's let's uh, make sure that people know where they can go and get to get oh, your sure. book and all of that stuff. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. So, Cooper stuff is on you know Apple, YouTube. I think I believe it's uh, I believe it's under Cooper stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I should know this anyway. Yeah, yeah Cooper stuff podcast and uh, yeah, we're working uh, skillet music. You know, we're working on new music now and things like you know, things like that. And uh, yeah, that's it, baby. Awesome. My website, if people really want to know, go to my website. You can get my book there. You can find my podcast there, johnlcooper.com. Awesome. And I'm at uh, YouTube, Elisa Childers. You can go to elisachilders.com. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook at Elisa Childers. So that's it. We did a this collaboration. This a big mashup. It was a mashup. Uh, uh, we got to have another mashup at some point. We'll do it for sure. <laughs> awesome. Great. Great chatting with you. You too.